In a previous video, I have explored the background of Victor Gutierrez, a Chilean freelance writer who participated in a NAM Black conference and who heavily influenced the false allegations against Michael Jackson during the 90s and the 2000s. The link to the video about Victor Gutierrez is in the description. The slanderous mockumentary Leaving Neverland, about the false allegations against Michael Jackson by two people who have been after a multi-million dollar monetary compensation for years, heavily relies on the same narrative that, during the 90s, was the roots of much fake news about Michael Jackson. All that fake news was debunked by real evidence during over a 10 year long investigation by police and FBI. One of the many people who actively helped to plant fake evidence and created fake news about Michael Jackson, is convicted pedophile Rodney Allen, and his specific case is a good indicator of the theme the movie Leaving Neverland is currently spinning. Rodney Allen, also known as John Templeton, is a Canadian man who, in the mid-90s, ran a prostitution ring of young underage boys in Toronto and was eventually arrested and convicted to a life sentence in 2001. Actual pedophile Rodney Allen was involved in a story about Michael Jackson that was first broken on hard copy in April 1995, by journalist Diane Diamond. Now the plot to destroy Michael Jackson, another young boy coming forward with allegations he was molested by the superstar. But when our Diane Diamond began to investigate, she uncovered a trail of lies. Diane? Terry, ever since the Michael Jackson child molestation scandal broke, we've gotten a constant stream of calls and letters from people making dubious claims about the singer. Frankly, we ignore most of them. But when I heard the facts of this story, I just had to go to Canada and check it out myself. And I'd like to make a confession about something that happened between me and Michael Jackson. He is only 15 years old, so we can't show you his face or let you hear his real name. But the 11-minute home video he sent hard copy several weeks ago could have become Michael Jackson's worst nightmare. Looking straight into the camera, using no notes, this boy proceeded to tell us in graphic detail how he and another teen were allegedly molested by the superstar. He started just touching like their stomach and things like he'd rub her stomach and then he'd, he'd get lower and then that's when I started saying like, what are you doing? He said, it's okay, don't worry, your bodies are meant to be touched. But the boy wasn't acting on his own, he had help. A man who identified himself as John Templeton of Mississauga, Canada. That's a suburb of Toronto. He sent us the boy's videotape statement and even called several times to make sure we looked at it. Then, I got a call from the boy himself. Brian Diamond. Over the next few days, I spoke with the boy for hours, and he never wavered. His story stayed consistent. The boy said he met Michael Jackson at a Canadian video arcade. He said he was supposed to spend the weekend with a friend, but when Jackson invited him to visit Neverland instead, off they flew in a private jet. This 15-year-old described in detail the people in Jackson's entourage, the layout of the ranch, and even Jackson's family home at Encino. Later, he would draw us incredibly detailed maps of both Jackson homes. It was clear either the boy was telling the truth or he had been well coached. To get to the bottom of it, I agreed to meet the boy and John Templeton in Toronto. The plan was to meet the pair in the lobby of an airport hotel, but when I arrived, the only one to greet me was the young boy. He came with me into town and told me that he lived on the streets of Toronto, in a section called Boys Town, where the street kids gather. He explained that his mother had kicked him out of the house and that John Templeton was just a man he'd met on the streets. He kind of helps the street kids, like just talks to them and things like that. Sort of like the guidance counselor of the street, that's what it seemed like. The boy appeared to be on his own. There was no sign of John Templeton and frankly that seemed suspicious. But over the next few days, a hard copy team conducted hours of interviews with the boy. Standing by were police officials in both California and Toronto. They were waiting to conduct their own investigation of the boys' charges. Hi, my name is Frank Grimes. I work for the TV show Hard Copy. Producer Frank Grimes and I worked to check out countless pieces of information the boy gave us. 
While sources were able to confirm much of what he said, there were some troubling inconsistencies. Still, the boy stubbornly stuck by his story, and he had an incredible knowledge of Michael Jackson's lifestyle. He showed me this place like a saddle shop where he said he, he, said he gets stuff for his animals there. I don't know what he got, but... It's a saddle shop. I see that on your map here. Yeah. People are going to think that you're out for his money. I don't care what he's money. They're going to think they're yeah, making it up. Yeah, I know. I know. But I don't care what his money. You can keep it. You tell him the absolute truth. Yeah. He talked for hours, and he knew so much. So much, in fact, that we thought, well, let's give him a test. You know, to see if we could trip him up. We showed the boy several photographs. Some of them were of Neverland employees, and he was able to identify each and every one of them. Yeah, that's him. We able to prove that. That's him. If this was a scam, this boy had really done his homework. He even went so far as to draw us a picture of what he said Michael Jackson looked like during the alleged molestation. Always, he came back to his claims of molestation. His eyes are big and they're they're dark, they cavern and like the sockets to go right in, you know. But there was one thing I didn't tell the boy. I didn't tell him that for the last year I've been getting Michael Jackson related letters from his same small suburb in Canada. The letters were supposedly from other young boys who also claimed that they had been molested by Jackson. Two of the letters even included pictures of the boys. Well, someone was behind all this, but still there was no sign of the man who'd sent us the original video statement of the boy. No sign of John Templeton. There's a Detective Campbell downtown. He doesn't know your name. He doesn't know anything yet. Okay. But he's waiting to see us. Want to go? Yeah. From the very beginning, the boy never asked us for money, and he repeatedly said he didn't want any money from Michael Jackson either. So what was his motivation? Well, he said it was simple. He said he wanted justice. And now he was about to give a sworn statement to the police. I want you to remember one thing. Just tell the truth. We delivered the boy to the Toronto Metro Police Headquarters, where detectives from the sexual assault unit had been waiting for us. I understand you want to speak to me. And that's okay. We're going to uh, go upstairs and yeah. talk to me. Okay. Okay? Yeah. For six solid hours, police questioned the boy, took his sworn statement. He told them just what he'd told us, that superstar Michael Jackson had molested him. I found a fairly believable thing. While the boy talked with police, we continued our investigation. We had to find this John Templeton. So we drove out to the Toronto suburbs to check out the return address from the videotape he'd sent us. That's when we ran into somebody we knew. What the hell is going on? Okay, Diane, let me explain something to you. Say hello to John Templeton, only his real name is Rodney Allen. We've known about Rodney for a long time. Right after the Michael Jackson scandal first broke, he was on the phone to us claiming that another Jackson family member had molested him years ago. Rodney has never offered any solid proof of this claim. He appeared to be a man bent on revenge. And Rodney admitted he was the one who'd been writing me all those letters. I care about this one kid who gave me all sorts of information about Neverland, about Havenhurst, about Disneyland, about Michael Jackson's body. Where did he get all that information? He got it from me. You planted all this stuff I in this kid's head. I didn't, I didn't plant it in his head. He was asking questions. I answered them as best I can. I told him what I could tell about the place. Because I, I want Michael to face it. So this kid is a A1, number one liar. The whole story was a scam. A Toronto street kid meets a man obsessed with the Michael Jackson case, and the result could have been an international scandal. Meanwhile, back at the police station, the boy finally broke down. He admitted that he and Rodney Allen had made up the whole story. The young boy was lying. Um, that's my belief, and, then, and as a result of that, he was charged, yes. Can you tell us what he was charged with? Uh, public mischief. Just a couple of months earlier, 
Diamond had cooperated with Nambla aficionado Victor Gutierrez and lied about a graphic sex tape involving Jackson and a young boy. The story was fabricated, and no such tape ever existed. Jackson sued Gutierrez, Diamond, and Stephen Doran of hard copy for slander for the sum of $100 million and won, but was never paid the $2.7 million awarded to him by the court, as Gutierrez flew back to Chile and declared bankruptcy, while Diamond escaped justice with the help of District Attorney Tom Snedden and the Shield Law. The Canadian boy false story involved the same key players that Jackson had sued in his lawsuit, at the time still pending, Diane Diamond and Stephen Doran. John Templeton was Rodney Allen, who had previously sent several letters to hard copy talking about alleged acts of pedophilia perpetrated by Jackson. None of that was true. Don't be fooled by Diane Diamond's apparently fair attitude in the video. She went to Canada hoping for a scoop, and only found a scam that she was forced to admit publicly. But she kept getting involved with Victor Gutierrez, the NAMBLA aficionado who participated in a NAMBLA conference in 1986. Not for a moment she appeared concerned about her source's reliability or morality, despite the overwhelming amount of fake news and rumors Gutierrez created about Jackson through the years. And Victor Gutierrez seems to be the link between Diamond and Rodney Allen. Despite having coached the Canadian boy about Michael's properties and entourage, Allen never stated he had seen the place nor that he had ever frequented Jackson and his people. The boy himself had never been to Neverland, let alone at the Jackson's house in Encino. He had never met Jackson at all. However, Allen spent an astonishing amount of time trying to frame Michael Jackson in a very detailed and clever manner. One might think that Allen is just an extremely intelligent serial predator. But this doesn't seem to be the case, as the court papers state that he is bordering on the mentally retarded spectrum. Mr. Allen was 45 years old at the time he was sentenced. He has a minor and unrelated adult criminal record. Growing up, he had difficulties at home and at school. Up until age 5, he suffered from epileptic seizures. Psychological reports produced when he was a young boy suggest that these seizures caused brain damage. According to IQ testing conducted at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health following his guilty plea, Mr. Allen's intellectual capacity is borderline, rated at 75 to 80. In 2001, Rodney Allen pleaded guilty to six sexual offenses against boys. In 2002 he was incarcerated in Canada as a dangerous offender, and in the year 2007, the Court of Appeal refused to change his life sentence. Before his arrest, nobody seemed too phased by his ever-increasing family of teenage boys. So, who is the link between Rodney Allen and Diane Diamond? A fair guess would be the ever-present Victor Gutierrez, who was defined by Diane Diamond as a source about whom she never had a doubt. At the time, Gutierrez was also directly in touch with a bunch of disgruntled ex-employees who never had any problems in selling lurid false stories to the tabloids about their former boss, Michael Jackson. These people were former security guards and maids, people who knew both Jackson's entourage and his property, in detail. Gutierrez had interviewed and sold stories on behalf of these ex-employees at Neverland, many of which appeared on hard copy or in tabloid print. The same fake news, perpetrated by these same poor jurors, are currently relaunched by several outlets while the movie Leaving Neverland gets heavily promoted on the media. A few years ago, one of Jackson's supporters got in touch with Rodney Allen via letter. This is her testimony. I wrote to Rodney Allen in prison and merely stated that a friend named Victor, no last name, encouraged the correspondence. Alan wrote back confirming that he knew Victor Gutierrez and even stated, I would really like to hear from him. It is funny how he pops into my life every now and then and changes my life so much. In his letter, he sounded eager to regain contact with his old friend Gutierrez and stated that he had found out who really terminated Michael Jackson's life. In future correspondence, 
Alan warned me about Victor and his scams to get my money for his own personal use, and called Gutierrez sneaky and underhanded. Additionally, he confirmed a 1999 internet post that read, in part, I was to be paid a large amount of money when things shuttle down, I was promised by Victor Gutierrez and Evan Chandler that it would be paid. But they didn't pay me. Michael never touched Jordan Chandler and sexually hurt him. Michael paid out the money to close the chapter on this scandal. Alan went on to write that he stayed with Gutierrez in LA, paying the landlord $500 during his month-long stay. Victor owed his landlord eight months back rent, he said. Confirming the NBC journalist's statement that Gutierrez was broke and needed money. Alan also claimed that at Gutierrez's request he removed toy trains, book negatives and paintings of Michael, from Victor's home and shipped them to Canada for safekeeping. He further stated that he accompanied Victor to Chicago for a book exhibition in 1995 to help promote Gutierrez's book. Victor faxed him a letter asking him to, send a hard copy to Nambly requesting that they list the book Michael Jackson was my lover in their books. A tabloid broker named Ken Wells availed himself to Michael's legal team in 1997, claiming to have information relevant to another litigation then pending in Santa Maria, California, involving Mr. Jackson and Evan Chandler. Wells had discussed, among other things, meeting Gutierrez during the course of his work as a broker. I contacted Ken Wells, who is no longer in the tabloid business, who stated, I've seen what other people have done to capitalize on his name, and a lot of false things have been said. The way I look at it, because of being in the tabloid business years ago is, if you don't see proof it's probably not there. People will say anything about a celebrity to make money. I don't want to be involved in something that's false. I've met Michael Jackson a couple of times, and the guy was not a child molester. I don't care what anyone says and if they think he is, they need to bring some kind of proof. Nobody has brought any kind of proof in all these years. Victor Gutierrez's man-boy love narrative is currently spun in Leaving Neverland, the slanderous and one-sided movie directed and produced by Dan Reed. The movie does not include any independent voice, evidence, contradictory, or fundamental right to defense, as per the director's choice. It also gives an umpteenth modified version of the alleged abuses when compared to court files and official documents. After stating under oath, both as kids and as adults, that Jackson had never been inappropriate to them in any way, Wade Robson and James Safechuck suddenly realized they had allegedly been molested by the artist, when Jackson was no longer alive. In the same exact way. At the same time, Robson and Safechuck have been sharing the same lawyers for years, and both aim at a multi-million dollar monetary settlement with the Michael Jackson estate, despite their case having already been thrown out of court twice. Even after an intensive four-month trial, and despite repeated searches of Michael Jackson's home and seizure of his belongings, including searches of every computer in his house, and over a decade of FBI surveillance, not one explicit smoking gun piece of evidence ever emerged. Despite Michael assiduously and religiously recording and documenting every aspect of his life, not one incriminating photo or video has ever surfaced. Not one. Meanwhile, a new development in the child sex abuse allegations at the factory against the 35-year-old singer, Sandra Hughes has details on that. CBS News has obtained a taped phone conversation. The voices are purportedly the father of the 13-year-old boy who is accusing Michael Jackson of molesting him and the boy's stepfather. The conversation was taped in July before the police began their investigation. This man is going to be humiliated beyond belief. He's not going to believe it. He will not believe what's going to happen. It's beyond, it's beyond his worst nightmares. So one more record. If I go through with this, I will get big time. I will get everything I want. They will be destroyed forever. 